So what I'd like to do, hi everybody, as, as a start. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm really delighted um, that Dion Chang has agreed to um, come and share a bit of Zoom time with me and all of you. And just to give you a little bit of background, I originally met um, Dion, let me just open up the right window here as a bit of an introduction. I originally met um, Dion and his partner, Bronwyn uh, Williams, at an event where they were speaking about the future. And as a futurist, um, I really just love their approach. I, I really love what they had to say and how they go about doing what they do and had to meet them. So <laughs> that's, that's how the, the connection originally happened. And by way of introduction, uh, Dion is the founder of Flux Trends. He's a business and foresight strategist. He's a trends columnist. He's a keynote speaker, business school lecturer, walking ideas bank, and a professional cage rattler in his own words. And uh, I think without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to, to Dion. Over to you. Great. Um, good morning, everybody. Just as I'm setting this up, um, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us all. Um, the, the talk I'm going to give um, today is, uh, is just a really condensed one. Uh, and as you see from the screen, uh, square pegs and round holes, why companies struggle to innovate. Um, I started on an innovation journey about four years ago. Um, and the first experience was actually attending an innovation tour um, of top performing companies in New York City. So uh, it was quite an intense uh, whole week. Uh, we looked at 50 different companies from architectural firms to retail um, uh, modules and concepts to um, advertising agencies, 3D printing factories. Um, and I went there to, to kind of find the, 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 the holy grail of innovation as such. And what I came back with was a 180 degree complete switch about to what actually made an innovative culture in, um, within a company. And, uh, and when I came back to South Africa, it just kept, uh, I kept bumping my head against this, um, hence this talk about why companies struggle to, to innovate. Um, so I'm gonna go through just a, a few of the, the, the touch points. We can um, do some questions after uh, Louise's uh, chat. But I'll go straight ahead, um, and I followed that innovation tour up with a, a session um, in Silicon Valley, and uh, it was also about a masterclass on how to scale innovation within very, very large companies. Um, and the one thing that struck me was uh, John C.D. Brown was one of the, the guests, and they had a conversation with him. And if you're not familiar with the name, John C.D. Brown is uh, considered the, the godfather of of innovation in Silicon Valley. Um, I think a lot of the interfaces you have on your, your laptops or your phones um, are all really linked to uh, what he has uh, done. And um, what he said was, and this is pre-pandemic, pre he just said, running a business in this digital age is like whitewater kayaking. And he said, it's, um, you know, you, you're trying to miss the boulders, you, you've got rapids, you've got undercurrents, you don't know what under, lies underneath and let, yet you've got to steer your companies there. And I thought that was just a really apt uh, way of looking at things. Um, you know, fast forward now to, to April, uh, the end of April, 2020, and this whitewater kayaking has turned into trying to kayak through a torrent because uh, the pandemic has really uh, also served much more undercurrents, much more curveballs. there's complete boulders we're trying to, to miss. So that's just kind of the context of where we really are. And I think while, the streets look like this. Um, you know, it's the old adage of, of what a, uh, a beautiful swan or a duck uh, paddling on, on, on still waters. Uh, it might look like that in all the cities, but I think underground, I think every single company are scrabbling around to try and find new ways to do things. Um, and for me, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a bittersweet thing because obviously the, the economy is being, being damaged, but also companies are really being forced to think about new ways of doing things and very, very innovative ways of, of doing things. Um, and so it's, it's no longer just a, a, a nice to have, or maybe we should do this in a year or two's time. 
um, I think in the next uh, quarter of the, of the year, we're going to really have to think once the workforce goes back in a very staggered way, calling it the great staggering, we're going to really have to think about how to do things. And what I've learned in all of these innovation masterclasses and tours is that there are signposts of innovation. You can check, check, have a checklist of what your company is doing or not doing um, in order to make sure that you're progressing. It's, it's everything from, are you looking at new technological breakthroughs? And, and I, I differentiate that from new technologies, but technological breakthroughs, that will enable you to do things. So, you know, these, these kind of platforms, the, the more they are refined, it's ways of doing remote work. Uh, there's a whole lot of ways of doing things. If you're a customer-based company, um, what is that customer experience and branding? Because that's the ultimate signpost of, of what your innovation is. So there's, there are those innovations that you can look through. But I think for all leadership, um, you know, we talk about ambid ambidextrous leadership. And I think this uh, in this time, it's even more important because before, even before the pandemic struck, it was trying to uh, digitize or digitalization of the business or bringing in new, uh, new technolog technologies and, and how new systems are doing that and still keeping that, that ship afloat. And that ambidextrous leadership has just notched itself um, just a, a few steps higher because we're really going to have to, to try and juggle an old world order and a new world order um, in terms of business. The analogy that I always use whenever I, uh, I talk or I, I give lectures at business schools as well um, is that, you know, if, we, if you think that we are literally about to get into driverless car technology and, and in 2019, uh, a lot of different shuttle systems uh, around the world were implemented uh, from Helsinki to the Navy, Brooklyn, uh, the Navy Yards in Brooklyn in New York. Um, the, the, the driverless car technology is not what we thought it might be. They're sort of shuttling from terminal to terminal. But my point is, if we're getting into this technology, why do we still use an old stick shift manual to run businesses? Uh, the, the systems are changed, it's completely digitized, but we use the same template, we use the same corporate structures, we use the same operating systems, and we expect new results in a digital era, and that's just not gonna happen. So a couple of the examples really are, you know, the, the old adage was you work your way up the corporate ladder and uh, you become the king of the castle. Um, in this day and age, and especially now in a post-pandemic world, you need to be in the center of the circle. You need to have your teams orbiting around you in a, a much flatter um, uh, uh, organizational structure to be able to sign things off quicker and, and get things moving uh, really fast. Um, the, the, the old hierarchy structures of signing or signing off really impedes good ideas, and it also slows down the innovation structure um, as well. The one I'm really passionate about is getting rid of silos. Um, if you think uh, about the job descriptions and how those lines have started blurring between different departments anyway, and the new hiring and recruitment that you're going to be doing within the company, because you know, you're going to have a head of algorithmic, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the CEO, of, uh, the, the head of algorithms, the head of this, uh, head of diversity, um, all of those kind of things. The lines between the different uh, duties start blurring. So why do you still have these rigid silos um, that just keep separating what uh, people do within, within companies? And then at the Silicon Valley um, session that I had, uh, I loved the slide. And if you haven't heard about the parable of the, the elephant and the blind man, the blind man, I think the larger the corporation is, the more this is really apparent because everybody has a different idea. And when you start communicating with companies, which both Louise and I do, you really start finding out that sometimes the communication is not really all that fluid. And, uh, and the messages get really, really mixed up. So when people say we need to get the whole company uh, on board, it's usually a C-suite or a leadership um, element that, that understands it, and then it's not communicated uh, throughout. And even on a leadership level, a lot of that communication gets warped and uh, it's, not, it's not synchronized and it's not succinct. So the other thing in terms of diversity and inclusivity, because that's also a really big one that's on the, on the radar, and especially in South Africa, um, I think we've, we've dealt with diversity quite well, but we haven't done inclusivity really, really well. So diversity is about who's in the room, but inclusivity is about what each person does. And I think that's the big stumbling block that we need to, to address in South Africa. But I want to look at diversity and inclusivity in a very different way. 
um, is about looking at innovation through the eyes of a child. And I did go to another diversity and inclusivity conference in New York um, last year. And one of the case studies that came through, which I really loved, was about a hospital that was trying to rejig their entire system. And they wanted to make it a lot more efficient, a lot more seamless. The user experience needed to be changed. And they did all the, different, the, the usual things. They asked the doctors, they spoke to the nurses, they spoke to the administrative staff. And at the end of the whole exercise, what they found was that the best insights that they got uh, that to change the system was actually from the security guard who stood in the emergency section um, and watched people come in and out and watched the, the hysteria, the panic, the, the, the onboarding of the admin processes. And they got the best um, insights uh, from there. So it's really to say, look at very different places of where you need to, to, to find the innovation and the good ideas. And then our question is, do you have a speak up culture in your, in, in, uh, your organization? Because if you don't have a speak up culture, innovating is really about disrupting the status quo, if you think about it. And if you can't allow different voices to, 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 to bubble up, um, and there we go with hierarchies and silos again, and specifically, I'm really passionate about this, is getting ideas from a younger workforce. It's, you know, I, I just get this constantly from, from senior executives to say, well, they don't understand the business. They, they uh, you know, we've been in it long, far longer than, than, than they have. But there are those ideas that they might be few and far between, but there are sometimes those gems of an idea like the security guard that stood in the hospital and gave the best insights uh, to people. The other thing is to really structure the innovation process. I think a lot of um, companies kind of bolt it on and think, well, that's just going to work organically. And it, it never really, really does. You have to have a really good structure of it. You've got to put dedicated teams in. Um, and this, what's on the screen here is just one of the, the ideas from it's called the, the conference board um, of how they structure it or how they bring different people into it. To, to eventually get an innovation project to do, to, to get to market. Um, and sometimes I get the, you know, the, the, the pushback and saying, well, this is going to you know, cost a lot of, um, uh, you know, the time and, and, and energy and especially for, uh, commitment from the workforce. And then my question back there is then how important is that innovation to the company if you don't really want to commit to it and really put a structure to that whole um, the whole uh, process. And then, you know, it's, it's just a monkey that your businesses use. You know, you want to be an agile business, you want it to fail fast. But um, one of the things that I picked up as well, um, not that Amazon's the most exemplary company, but I like the one case study about how they look at failure. So if you're going to be putting projects together, and I also um, advocate, and yes, it's going to take a lot more um, money to do that, but um, in this day and age, you start not one, but two or three projects at the same time, because they're not all gonna land and you need to budget for failure, which CFOs hate hearing, but it's a, it's a truth there. But the one thing that Amazon does in terms of their teams is they have um, fitness tests. So that's not a new thing within, within companies, but what is different is if a, uh, uh, one of the, the teams fails a fitness test, um, the senior management, they disband the team, but the senior management actually go away and they ask the question, how did we fail them? Not you failed this and what was the, the problem there? The management actually asked, how did we fail you and not enable you to do that? And I think it's a, it's a really important mindset and switch to have uh, to do that. And so, you know, for, for, for us, um, to looking at kind of the future of work, it's always uh, reskill, reskill and continually upskill. Um, and for me, the new CSI, I spoke at a CSI conference, and I said, if you look at the techn technological displacement, uh, we need to start thinking about a different way of CSI. CSI, especially in South Africa, largest Gini coefficient on the planet, you need to look at communities and societies outside and, and corporations and public uh, sector has to help that as well. But I think a new version of looking at CSI is continual upskilling of your current workforce so that they are... Uh, if, if and when they lose their jobs to an algorithm or automation, um, they have a fighting chance of, of getting another job or being displaced into a different industry. But you also get um, the, the, the latest uh, learnings uh, within that workforce. And then especially for new C-suite skills, 
um, you know, is uh, changing it from the CFO or the CEO to the chief learning officer. And I think we need to kind of look at that is because I think everybody, the entire company, the whole structure is in a learning phase. And especially in a post-pandemic world, we are all in that learning phase. And uh, we did a session last week uh, with Louise and I talked about going from a performance zone into a learning zone. And athletes do that. They are in a, a learning zone 95% of the time. And in that 5%, they perform and they do remarkable things. In business, we stay in the performance zone for 95% of the time. We do a little bush break or we do a conference and we expect that 5% to have results and it doesn't always have those results. And then my final one, just to throw into the future, not to a too distant future, is to look at your new workforce. And if you're a customer-based company, your new customer. And so your Gen Zs, the oldest ones are 21, 22. They're coming of age now. They are entering the workforce. And if you think about what uh, sexual liberation in, uh, was for the baby boomers, sustainability and social justice is what sexual liberation was to baby boomers. And this is what Gen Z is going to do. And very much like millennials, whose perspective of savings and of security was shaped by 9-11 and the 2008 Great Recession, then this pandemic, a, an epoch-defining moment uh, for the planet, is really going to shape uh, the future workforce that is coming to you and your future customer. So that's really a short uh, synopsis of this talk, and it's really time to rethink, and I hope you rethink with great structure and maybe not rush into it too, too fast and structure it properly um, so that you have a, a great long-term result. And that's a short chat for me. Thanks, Louise, and thanks everybody for listening. I'll just take thanks, Jill. Yeah, thank you. Great stuff. So um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And um, for those of you who haven't yet, please go over to slido.com and enter the uh, event number 56338. And we're asking a question there, how do you feel about the future? And I'll pop into that in a moment and just see um, where we're at. So Dion, thank you so much. I think the key, um, one of the key things that I got out of that is very much that innovation is a people thing. And that's pretty much what I want to talk to you about today. For those of you who don't know me, I am a conscious leadership coach and consultant, a keynote speaker, lecturer, uh, dabble in trends, futures and foresight, and I'm really passionate about building cultures of innovation. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about that element. And when I think of building a culture of innovation, uh, I really think about you know, weaving the fabric, the very essence of innovation into the fabric of our organizations, rather than innovation being a strategy for the future, or a strategy for now, or perhaps something that we've had to knee jerk into um, with this particular crisis that, that we're in the middle of. So the big question, where are we? And Marina Gorbis from the Institute of the Future and Paolo Alto really put it quite succinctly for me, phase one, phase two, and phase three of, of the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic that we're, we're all dealing with day to day. Phase one was reveal and react, crisis management, and what came with it was our myths and truths started falling away. And the very vulnerabilities in our operating, operating systems uh, were starting to be revealed to us and continue to be revealed to us. Phase two, reassess, reevaluate, and reset. And here we really are asking ourselves a whole bunch of questions. What does it all mean? How did we get here? Who or what is responsible? And why did this happen? and phase three, reinvention. And a lot of what we're talking about today is around phase three. What can we do from today to prepare for or prevent from ha this happening again? And from everything that we're hearing, uh, there are the possibility of future pandemics, perhaps something like this are um, immensely possible. So just looking at phase two, well, if we look at the, the, the perfect storm, the, we had all of the, the right ingredients for this, climate change, population growth, global mobility, and the fact that we're all interconnected and connected. 
um, led us here. And along with that, and I think it's something perhaps we're not thinking enough about right now, but we will do um, as time goes by, is that um, most of our rewards and incentives have been very short term, and that's right across all of our systems, including learning, education, health, business, economic, society, the environment. And looking at reinvention, there are a bunch of questions. I mean, you know, we, we all watch the same news. We're all um, asking ourselves the same stuff. And I would have no doubt that all of us are asking ourselves these questions right now. What kind of future do we want to live in? How can we all get involved uh, in building it? Which part of normal do we want to keep? And what type of new normal do we want to create? And most importantly, what's our capacity to start doing this from today? And, you know, often we see these things as interesting memes popping up. Um, human beings are amazing. Uh, the minute something changes, of course, our language changes around it. And just referring back to that last question, what can we do today that will serve us going forward? And really what we're focused on in this um, session is building personal team and organizational capabilities around resilience, agility, creativity, and innovation. And along with it, we need to create incentives and rewards for long-term thinking and action if we're going to um, avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. And key there is changing our patterns of behavior. And I, I don't know, if you're anything like me and you've ever done anything around um, self-development or you develop teams or an organization where you're dealing with people, we know that changing our behavior isn't the easiest thing. Uh, the, the behavior is what sits on the outside. Uh, being drives doing. It means a shift in who we are. And uh, that can take a little work. But first of all, recognition um, as to where we're at. So when we're looking at this type of uh, building in, you know, cultures of innovation, or innovative cultures, what we first need to be able to do is to identify the capabilities within ourselves, our teams, and our organizations. So just a little backstory here to, to add a little meat to the bone, but um, one of the organizations that I work with is Lumina Learning. And about towards the end of last, probably third quarter last year, they were approached by the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences, who, who knew Lumina Learning. They said, you know, with your wealth of integrated digital assessments and psychometrics, um, can you come up with a model for innovation? And some really bright minds at Lumina took up the challenge and they started digging into what is innovation? What is creativity? And what's the difference as a start? And they're all incredibly good questions. Often we take these things, things for granted or our understanding of it for granted. And they came up with a beautifully clean, simple, elegant solution, or definition, I should say. And that is innovation, is great ideas, lots of ideas, putting them into action, implementing them. And the byproduct, the result of that, is innovation. And I think, um, as I've, I've said often before, we often think that innovation is a gene that we're born with or not. You know, some people are creative and innovative and other people aren't. Um, and really what I'd like to do is to show you today that innovation is actually a bit of a team sport and uh, that's not necessarily true. We talked, Dion talked a lot about um, people and language and perhaps creating a new language for moving us into the future. And I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I certainly have, but um, words like hustle and grit have disappeared. And today we're talking about leaders needing to be right at the top of the leadership wanted list, agile leaders, creative, innovative, um, empathetic, resilient. And I want to explore these as well a little today in relation to our ability to be innovative. But before we do that, we've got to look at the mental health shock that has happened over the last month or two. And um, Qualtrics had a look at this. I think it was end of March, early April. So I'm sure the figures have adjusted slightly. And they looked across a bunch of countries and asked people how they were doing from a mental health perspective. And just over 46% uh, reported a decline in their mental health. 
And the top five were anxiety, stress, worrying about losing your job, being less busy, and of course, all of the challenges that come with um, working from home. So that's just to give us a little bit of context in terms of what, where we might be coming from. And then I thought, well, okay, let's have a look at the neuroscience behind this. What is the ideal neurochemical cocktail for the best possible, for you to be in the best possible state for your best creative work? So we're back to our old friends, serotonin and dopamine. And um, of course, serotonin, when you have high serotonin, we're calm and contented. When it's low, we're rather anxious and fearful, and that plays back into my previous slide around mental health. And of course, when our dopamine is high, we're excited and we're engaged, and when it's low, we're bored or apathetic. So no surprises, Professor Fabership from Stanford, um, Graduate School of Business, wrote an amazing paper about using neuroscience to boost your creativity. And the perfect formula, the ideal neurochemical cocktail for to do your best creative work is high serotonin and high dopamine, calm and energized. And if we look at that in the context of the other leadership quality that um, everybody's talking about that we need right now, um, which is empathy. And what is empathy? Empathy is I see you, I hear you, I feel you, I get you in short, in short term. And the beautiful thing about empathy is I don't have to agree with you, uh, but real active listening, I can begin to understand why you might be doing what you're doing or saying why, what you're saying or behaving in the way that you are behaving. Uh, but I don't necessarily have to agree. And empathy is just such a powerful foundation for all communication. So when we use, interestingly enough, when we use empathy to engage with other people, back to our old friend, serotonin, we both get a hit of serotonin. We both benefit. And on the, the other side of things, when we blame others, and we'll see a lot of blame right, going on right now, it's, it's um, the government's fault, it's China's fault, it's God's fault, it's, it's our fault. Um, and we get actually a hit of dopamine, uh, which is why it's so incredibly addictive. The problem with blaming others, systems, whatever it might be, is that in robbing others of their dopamine, they fight back, and this is where we find conflict. And if you haven't read Judith Glazer's um, Conversational Intelligence, do. It's a fabulous book. It talks about the neuroscience behind coaching and growth as a leader and all the good stuff that, um, that uh, we really want to tap into right now. And then, of course, the big question. I mean, you can't trip over anything on any platform right now without people talking about leadership resilience or the resilience of an organization. And the question there is, well, what is emotional resilience? Of course, we've got technological resilience, we've got resilience in systems, but let's talk about people right now. And emotional resilience, I think we, we all understand, is the ability to adapt to stress or situational crises, able to roll with the punches, adapt to adversity without last, lasting difficulties. So, so it's really a mutable quality. Um, and if you're low on, on emotional resilience, you're going to find it harder to deal with stress and life changes, both major and minor. And I would say without a doubt, we, I think we'll all agree that this is a major life change for all of us. This is a human crisis. Um, it doesn't start off with the markets crashing or a financial crisis. It's very much a human crisis. And we may all be in it together, but it's certainly not equitable. So the, the, the sweetest definition I've come across in the last couple of weeks, and I've been really tapping into what does resilience actually look like for us human beings, is the ability to actually accept a situation without resentment. So it doesn't mean lie down and die, give up, stop trying to make changes. It, you know, we're sitting in the middle of a pandemic. And do I accept it without resentment? I mean, who do I resent? I need to go into blame mode for my hit of dopamine for that. Um, but if I can accept it for what it is, from that place, um, I can move forward. And that, for me, is the, as I say, the sweetest definition of resilience I've come across so far. So just going back to this, um, to building a culture of innovation. When Lumina were approached by KFAS, um, these bright, smart minds and PhDs and um, some people involved in innovation and industrial psychology and, you know, all came together and they said, okay, well, what is innovation? You know, 
And they agreed on the fact that it really, innovation is sort of an eight part um, journey. Um, I'm just gonna, I don't know whether you can see that bar that I'm fiddling around with, I hope not. Um, but really, we've heard all of this stuff for so long already. We need to keep our options open. We need to be able to experiment, A-B test, communicate openly, move fast and break things, iterate continuously, limit the downsides, listen to stakeholder feedback and learn to love failure. And the beautiful thing is that when we actually look at people and um, our personalities and the qualities that we have as, as individual people, this maps really into the kind of measurement tools that Lumina uses. So we're able to see that in order to experiment an A-B test, you need to be a big picture thinker. Um, to communicate openly, you probably need some extroversion. You need to be sociable, demonstrative, take charge, move fast and break things, um, outcome focus, logical, competitive and tough, iterate continuous, continuously, discipline driven, limit the downside, you need to be down to earth, listen to stakeholder feedback, you need to be introverted and um, observing, measured, intimate, learn to love failure. And I'm sure you can see exactly what's on my screen, so I won't go through it all. And uh, let's just move on to the next slide. So that gives us some sort of foundation of what is innovation. And if we head over to Slido once again, I'm going to ask you another question. So I hope you've got a, a window open and um, I'm going to pause that last poll. And I'm going to ask you if it'll let me to rate yourself on a, how creative and innovative you think you are. And let's go into that and see what your responses are. So we've got 0% on ratings of 10 and 20%, 3% sitting on 30% and so forth. So it looks like most people think that they are innovative and creative. Okay, so get out of that and get back to... Okay, so that's, that's pretty high. And um, the next question we need to ask ourselves as the innovators is, and they're questions really worth asking, what qualities do you have that help or hinder your ability to be an editor? What qualities does your team and your organization have or lack? And how can we actually measure it? Because, you know, I asked you very unfairly a question not based on, on any measurement tool, but how we perceive ourselves or perhaps the kind of feedback we've had from others in the past. So one of the interesting things about working with KFAS is that Lumina measure all of these qualities. And if we look at the splash in the middle, this is kind of a visual representation of where we sit um, with all of these different qualities that make up the eight different parts of um, being innovative. And if we have to take this particular individual, I've, I've just overlaid one particular splash of somebody who I don't actually know, um, straight into the middle of this. And we can see that this particular person would be great at moving fast and breaking things. They're pretty outcome focused. They're logical, tough, high competitive. And they're also great at communicating openly, very demonstrative. Um, extroverted, sociable, taking charge, um, quite high on the big picture thinking, conceptual, imaginative and radical. And I think often when we think of um, being innovative, we often think of, you know, this big picture thinking, having lots of ideas. And yet, as we can see from this, it's a whole range of things that actually allow an innovation to eventually come to market. Uh, one thing that if I was this particular person and I saw my own measurement against what it is to, to be innovative, I would immediately know that I would either, well, certainly these are qualities I would need to develop within myself, but also I would need to collaborate and work with others so that together we were stronger and we were able to actually fulfill all of the various different parts that make up innovation. Um, so just really interesting to see that we can actually measure this, and this can be measured in 20 minutes, really. And then probably the most fun part is if you're working with your team or your organization, you're saying, well, okay, we need to weave innovation into the very fabric of how we go about doing what we do. Um, so what does it look like from a team perspective? Well, all of these little dots are people, and it's where they sit in their 
day to day, where they're most comfortable, how they're showing up, how they're getting about doing what they do. And um, we can see from this particular team, there are 14 people in this team. And if this were the team who were driving the strategy behind innovation, they would really need um, to augment their team with a bunch of people who had the qualities that are sitting right over here, you know, people focused, inspiration driven, and big picture thinking. And for me, I, I like to measure things. I like to see exactly where we're at rather than just guessing and using age old wisdoms and, and um, subjective uh, ideas. Of course, often teams look very similar because people buy people like themselves. There's a fantastic book that you might want to have a look at to explore this for yourself called Range, where they get into the nitty gritty and the research behind how teams that are diverse and often we talk about diversity and we think of race and a whole bunch of other things. But really, when we, we're looking at building innovative teams or we're looking at um, building innovation as an organizational capability, we need to look at the qualities that pre people bring to the table in terms of who they are. So it's just nice to be able to see exactly what's going on in a flash. And then really most of the type of work that I do is working with leaders and leadership teams, leaders, leaders at all levels, um, uh, depending on the size of the organization. And just harping back to this shift in language around leadership and also what leadership needs to look like going forward. So it, for a lot of people um, who haven't shifted over recent years, um, that old school type thinking where leaders provide all the answers um, I think we're realizing how vulnerable we are if we think like that. We need to be thought partners to the people in our businesses and all of our stakeholders where they need us. And the other major thing that's come out of this for me is that we are only, we're really only as resilient as the most vulnerable people around us. And I think that, um, you know, if it took something like a, a pandemic for us to really realize that, then... Um, then perhaps there is um, some good to be found out of this from that perspective. Uh, so I'm gonna hand over to you, Claire. Thank you, Louise. Um, sat very quietly and listened very intently. Always fantastic insights from both you and Dion. Um, we had a question initially from Chantal Wiley um, and uh, Dion indicated he'd like to, to take this discussion further. Um, she mentioned as coaches and consultants supporting leaders organizations she would appreciate some discussion from this angle for example how do we keep clients optimistic when they're out working for sasa handing out free parcels and dealing with riots um she made some further comment there if you can maybe pass it on to dion if you would like to comment on that yeah sure thanks um, Claire, and thanks Chantal, for for your question um the i, I just wanted I, I looked i saw your first part and i'll try and do this the second part as, as well because i think they're both really important ones mm -hmm. and um, I take your point that you know the, we, we do talk a, a lot about more agile companies that are able to to move and shift quite uh, quite quickly. Um, but but some of the observations that I, I, I did in my talk was about really really large rigid structures that, that that can't move. And I know we can't change those overnight. But just to your first one about keeping people sort of optimistic as well. And uh, this is more of a personal story as well. And I think it, it but I think it, it will resonate with everybody. I think. You know, you, I think there's two types of people that, that are dealing with this pandemic. There the, the are people that are, are baking lots of sourdough bread and signing up for online courses and have all the time in the world. And then the other lot who are completely scrambling to just try and, and, and catch up and, and readjust to that and recalibrate their, their, their businesses. Um, I fall into that, uh, the, the latter category because I'm a small business and just trying to, to keep ahead above water. Um, and there's so much to do and, you know, I'm a, I'm a list maker and I try and this, I've got to still do this, this, this and this and the hours of, uh, in the evenings keep stretching longer and longer um, and I'm not finding any transition zone. So this is kind of just taking it away from a, from a purely business perspective and, and, and maybe a little bit more of an esoteric one, but also to, to just the importance about those transition zones. When we are in lockdown and we, everything is digital, you really have to step away from the machines. And I think about keeping people more optimistic and, and, and positive is actually just re at the end of the day, and I don't think we actually do this, is look back and see what you've actually accomplished because it's always going to seem an insurmountable mountain of work that you need to do. You need to get these processes done, all of those kind of things. 
But I think we forget how much we are actually able to do during, during the day and during lockdown. And even if they're small incremental steps and they're changing a system very slowly, a small turn, a small turn, it still is that, that incremental thing. So it's to, for me, it's about acknowledging um, what you, you are able to, to do. And, and within those companies, if they are handing out food parcels, that empathy chip that's been ignited, I think is a very important one because I think we're gonna go into a post-pandemic um, environment uh, very changed. And as Louise said, and as I said, I think we also, you know, we, we look at workforce, we look at that, but on a personal level, we have all experienced this kind of existential shift. So we've got to, to look at it. I'm just going to jump um, ahead because there was a, a question and I know Claire, you'll probably uh, maybe give that to Louise to answer, um, mm -hmm. you know, from Mark, um, you know, about what people are doing. And, and his comment is about, you know, looking at relationships and looking at the human aspect of it so i think one of the big things is 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 trying to to do that is kind of separate the business side of things um and and, and really look at the human things and, and 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 what kind of empathy that stretches beyond hr that stretches beyond the roles of, of what you're doing things is, is you know I'm, I'm finding a lot of organizations have set up their own um just quick 10 minute remote check-ins with their, with their teams every morning, not to discuss business, but just to say, how are you doing? Does anybody need support? Do you need any deliveries? Do you need, you know, so, so going beyond the boundaries of, of just purely what your business does. And I think that is a, a integral part of, of that. And, and that's what, you know, Mark was, um, uh, was saying. And then just to end off with, with Chantal, the, the, I think the thing about very large government and, and very large organizations is, is kind of just looking at the, the, the UX, the user experience. I've had my own experience uh, with that just this, this week, um, which I'll share. You know, it's, it's really nice that uh, President Ramaphosa said we've got this huge stimulus package. On the very, very same day, I discovered that I couldn't uh, clear or uh, get invoices into uh, my much needed non-existent cash flow um, was because I, had, uh, I, I paid my VAT bill, the last VAT cycle, 24 hours late. So I was flagged as non-tax compliant, even though for 12 years of running my business, I paid everything on time. And for the first time in difficult circumstances, I was late with the payment for 24 hours. I was given a huge penalty and flagged as non-tax compliant, which is a slur against the business's name. And I think while, yes, we are trying to do the immediate stuff is also to look at those kind of details of the user experience of, of what uh, I don't think it's necessary to 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 really look that far into the, the, the future of what uh, Niels is saying, um, but also just to really tidy up what, what the, the immediate thing is. And then that goes into the, the, the empathy for the workforce and, and, and going beyond just what is work related to, to seeing how, how you can help other people there. And I hope that's uh, kind of answered a question or, or helped uh, spark some more um, debate. Thank you very much, Dion. Louise, I'm just curious, uh, cautious of time. Is there time for a question? Could I potentially even pose one to you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I know we often have uh, many discussions about um, clients generically in the CEO space. What, in your opinion, are the three single largest barriers hampering the South African corporate CEO in developing a culture of innovation? Well, I think, you know, I've spoken so much about innovation today and I've just seen from a couple of comments that really, the, without a doubt, the most important thing is actually mental health right now. Mm. And um, three important things for CEO, be human, be human and be human. Uh, you know, I, mm. I really, from a technical perspective, sure, there's a whole lot of rearranging that's been done. And if I think of the restructuring that um, companies are going through right now, pulling apart bits of their companies, the people side is often the last thing in that list yeah. of things to do because, of course, we need to reorganize organize our businesses, um, all the different operations, and pull things together so that we can continue to function mm -hmm. as an organization and chop dead wood out of the organization. Saying that, you know, often once that's done, it then, then gets passed on to HR or, uh, you know, learning and development or people, people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're the ones under the most stress at the moment, it, you know, yeah. from a strategic perspective. Look, I think it's very difficult. I work a lot with leaders um, looking at multiple futures um, and playing things out. One thing I found working with leaders today is that every time, every time we play out a potential future, 
um, there are parts of that that where hindsight just won't work for foresight because whatever we're thinking that may be a solution going forward, we know it will change, but we have no idea what it may look like. So whilst there is all of that sort of head scratching stuff going on and that rush to reorganize, restructure so that we've got a viable entity that can carry people through at the same time, um, I think without a doubt, leaders have got to lead with empathy. We've got to connect with humans. We're all, we're all under extreme stress and pressure. And I don't know, I mean, if you're anything like me and my friends and my family and my community and my clients, you know, we seem to sort of go through days where we're kind of okay and then hit, hit a bit of a wobble and we need to dig deep and perhaps that's the resilience kicking in and then we perhaps find our way. And I'm hearing that from everybody. It doesn't really matter at what what level they're at so so as i said before this is a human crisis and we we can't forget that um the other thing i just want to add one last thing on about productivity because if i hear somebody else saying how exciting it is that everybody's 30 percent more productive um i want to say yeah but we're looking at a 50 percent more burnout problem so um you know take it a take as dion said right at the start take your time think things through you know, allow things to evolve, to emerge, so that you, you've got better ideas of what may be coming. But in doing so, in, in taking that approach, also, you know, work at things from the heart center as well as the head center. Mm -hmm. but we have to start coming at things from a, we have to lead with the human, you know, from a human perspective. And that's how, you know, we're able to rate, relate. And without a doubt, the leaders who, who do, do better in this, during this time will, will be those who've been able to lead with empathy and build trust, Absolutely. whatever the outcome. Yeah, garnering the support of their teams. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see we still have a lot of people on the line. Um, feel free, if, if your time's up, to head off. We've, we've got um, perhaps five minutes before 12. And um, I don't know, Dion, is there another question in there that you'd like to jump in on? Um, no, but it, it is a closing um, comment, because uh, I know we're just running out of time. But about two years ago, uh, what we did was we, at Flux, we, uh, sent, uh, we created a, a new report about um, mental health uh, or well-being within the workplace. And we obviously, because our mantra is trends as business strategy, we, we placed that responsibility at um, the, the foot of the corporate or the, the, the big company. Um, one of the things that uh, we suggested then, and I think it's going to even resonate now in terms of being human, what you were mentioning, is um, we said, you know, there was a whole thing, um, I think it was a momentum study that, uh, you know, people were um, absenteeism versus presenteeism. And, uh, you know, just even uh, a year ago, people were really stressed out about their finances and, 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 and worried about that. I mean, that's just um, quadrupled now because of loss of earnings things, lots of all of those kind of things. And the one thing we ad advocated to, to companies was to, to give people a, a, a mental, a, a financial wellness day off. And now that we've been locked down, maybe you don't have to give that day off. But um, the other one was to actually say, why don't you bring in a financial advisor to help people plan with their budgets? And I think it's a perfect opportunity, which is very doable in a large corporation because you're not going to get an entire workforce of 500 people or more coming back to work at the same time. It's going to be a very, very staggered way of doing things. The first 100 people, you're going to be working in shifts. That's, that's the way it's going to work. And within that, I think there's, there's room to be, that, to, to be that empathetic employer and say, we have a financial consultant here today, and we also have a psychologist. If you have any uh, mental issues to do that on company time, we will allow you to chat to somebody about a budget. We will allow you to chat to somebody about relationships, about that thing, just so that the, the, the basis and the foundation of your workforce is solid and then can go back again. It's, it's again, one of those things that I said was going beyond the reach of what is business and what are the parameters of HR and all of those kind of things and, and just reaching out and being a little bit more human. So that's just my, my kind of final comment on that. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Claire. Um, none of this would have been possible without your help. And um, yeah, and, and I'm going to leave it at that. Just, Last but not least, um, I'll be sending through a recording and contact details, links for everybody. Um, 
if you'd like to watch this again or if you'd like to get hold of Dion or myself or Claire. So thank you so much for um, joining me and I, I look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully in the flesh and not just over Zoom. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, bye.